I'll start with a little bio from Antonio Ruiz, uh, basically born in Yuma, Arizona, um, mother and father, father the entertainer, mother was a housewife, um, eventually started going downhill with schizophrenia. Um, they divorced over the process. My dad couldn't handle what was going on. And uh, he took off to Hawaii and basically left us alone to fend for ourselves for a while with my mother. And eventually I couldn't take it and actually jump ship from her and went to Hawaii to live there for a little while. Um, education, didn't take it seriously. I did, really didn't have an idea what was happening or what to do with myself at that age. I started boxing a little bit. Living in Hawaii as a white boy, uh, you have to pick up on some fighting skills, so I did that. Um, but I really didn't have no direction about who I was or what I was going to be until I ran into my uncle. And he basically sat me down and said, you know, you don't even know how to brush your teeth, take care of yourself, so I'm going to help you out with this. And was very regimented. And the interesting part was I really m gravitated to that man because of his interaction with me to try and buckle me down and, and set me straight. Um, when he wound up leaving Hawaii to go to work in uh, Alaska, it kind of devastated me. My father took off again once again to work out of, out of the state and in Louisiana, and I really didn't know what to do. I, I was lost without him. So with my uncle out of the picture, I picked up and ran away for my first time at age 14. I just turned 14. And by the time my, pa my father got a hold of me, he said, if you come out to Louisiana with me, um, I'll try and you know, keep you with me and settle things down. So I took off to Louisiana. In the process of that, I met a, woman, a girl there, a girl at the age of uh, 14 and a half, going on 15 that year, it was over the summertime. Became my girlfriend, um, six months, pregnant, and at that point, my life had really made a complete change to where I thought I knew who I was and what I wanted to do, and that was start my life's journey at that age, which was ridiculous. Um, but I did it. In the process of going through jobs in and out and uh, no one wanting to hire a 15, 16, 17-year-old to help pay for a family, uh, I finally landed on a couple good jobs. Was working at uh, Union Tank Car Company welding, and at that point, I thought I'd, I'd found my little niche in life, and I was going to be okay. And they had a major layoff with Exxon, cut the workers there also. When the oil glut hit in the early '80s, and I was driving home from work that day, and I was just so depressed over the fact that I was nowhere close to what I really loved doing, which was medicine. I wanted to be a doctor since I was a little kid. In the back of my mind, that was the dream that I wanted to do. I didn't know how to get there or achieve it. I had very poor uh, education skills. My math was terrible. My English, I mean, being raised in Hawaii and, and a Mexican background, it was terrible. Uh, but there was a sign on the way back there and it said, you know, be all you can be, join the army, go to medical school. And uh, I just wheeled in, walked in there and basically said I've had enough with trying to raise a family on this situation and, you know, I want to, I want to be able to go to school. And they threw a little offer at me and I, I, I took it. Uh, before I knew it, I was at basic training in Fort Jackson, sitting in an airborne package platoon, not knowing that I was going to be jumping out of planes because I thought I signed up to be a a flight medic going to the 82nd Airborne Division. And uh, my life kind of started to change at that point. I started to move in directions that it, I didn't know were possible. Um, the medicine was unbelievable that I got because I happened to link into friends that knew about the Ranger Regiment and was picked up, <laughs> went to RIP, and my life was on fire. I mean, I ran into a, a gentleman there named Doc Donovan, who's well known throughout the special operations community, and was instilling the trauma medicine that you now see in every ER and ED today, thanks to his teachings and believing that medics and junior personnel should be trained to a, a level that can save lives within the golden hour. And uh, 
uh, still not having the basic educational skills and the understanding of how to study correctly, it was very difficult for me to get to certain levels that everybody else was excelling pretty easily in the educational system in medicine. So I had struggles, it was tough. And I tried to hide them by my athleticism, how I handled myself as a leader, and I got through. I mean, I, I faked it until I made it. And um, there was a couple instances where a helicopter crash happened where I got to excel and prove myself after I was actually being kicked out of a, a school in the Special Operations Committee for 300F1, which is a, the Special Forces Trauma Medicine course. And I was just doing stupid stuff there with SEALs that I shouldn't have been doing and concentrating on my medicine. But that was a turning point for me and my whole understanding of, of how serious my job was. I mean, after treating everybody in the accident and get being at the hospital at Womack, uh, the ride back, knowing men had died that day, in a training accident and some of the guys were saved by the, the by the medicine that we had learned that day in our day back in the range of battalion really got me motivated to work harder at my education <clears throat> being married young 10 years difficult uh, but at that point I was trying to get to PA school knocking out my uh, junior education level courses to allow me to move to that direction and in process, uh, let my marriage fall apart. There were multiple reasons. I mean, the list could be numerous why they did, why it was going to fail. Uh, but in the process of that, I, I kind of turned against what was keeping me alive and moving me forward, which was the military. I got angry. Was angry with my command. No one understood me. I didn't understand why my decisions were what they or how they were happening. Um, I did, at this point I kind of just jumped over uh, Panama. Uh, we did do Operation Just Cause, jumped in combat. Um, did some pretty interesting things in, in that environment that, you know, you wait for this whole moment to go to combat with your element and do it. And then when you're done, uh, there's really a, a search what comes next and how to, how to fill that. And I think that generated a lot of the uh, momentum too that in the directions I was trying to get to, to PA school and the friction in my marriage, things that were happening there. It was just a lot to handle. Um, not having a father or a mother to call upon during this episode of what was happening in my life for guidance or uh, direction kind of led me, I led myself in, into a hole that basically was pretty deep and hard to get out of. Uh, I was basically <laughs> in one of the better jobs that you could find yourself in, in medicine at the 82nd Airborne Division and thought I was the most miserable person alive and there was no reason for it. Uh, had great leaders around me, uh, individuals trying to teach me things that I was learning but I wasn't grasping and understanding that this was uh, a area of of medicine that's there in the intelligence portion of it that now would be, I could be making lucrative money if I had to understand what I was doing at that point, being on a general staff and helping them brief every day on real world situations that were happening across the world was a very gift that was given to me and I squandered it basically because I was so uh, immature because of the fact I didn't have parental figures to help me through that process to figure out whether I was making deci bad decisions or not. Um, so I was ba basically kicked out of the Army by telling them I didn't want to play anymore. It, I, I wasn't happy. I wanted to figure this whole divorce thing out on my own. I was pissed off at the, all, all the directions it was going in and it just got worse and worse. I met people that were dealing drugs, that were doing drugs uh, in bars because I was bouncing at night. Um, and just hanging around bad people, making more bad decisions. And eventually, I went homeless for a while. Uh, was trying to figure out how to get out of that spiral and there wasn't any uh, assistance back then in 96 to 98. And uh, I basically woke up one day and said, I wanna go to some place where I can get a start where people care about people. And I could come to mind was a church. And I basically walked out there and slept behind the church that day all day. And 
waited and waited and waited and uh, I realized that it wasn't Sunday and that no one was going to be there probably till later on in the afternoon and picked up myself and went walking on and uh, ran into a construction job and started working construction that day. Um, in and out of uh, fighting with women and living environments that were unhealthy in that process. I could have gone right back in the military and been saved if I had had guidance once again, mentors to grab hold of me and tell me basically, Antonio, you don't have to make these decisions. You know, you could be back working uh, in the environment, making money again, and you know, getting your children back in your life. Uh, those things were all just so far away and too hard to grasp for me even to open that door and, and play with those ideas because it hurt so bad. But uh, I just didn't have any place to go. And then and I remember that. I was like, here I am, worked all these years so hard from the age of 14 to be homeless at this point. And I, I just couldn't understand how is that possible today with you know such a great country and the things that I've seen and done in foreign countries and how poor and tough it is. And yet here we have such an abundance and our people are homeless. And that really, for some reason, would make it escalate into more anger and uh, the decisions were worse. Started a security company. Um, I started, uh, I, when you round money, I kind of figured you make more money. I started getting in that environment, bouncing at the nightclubs down in South, for South Beach, Florida. Uh, got caught up in a situation of basically playing Wells Fargo and looking the other way. As long as I didn't see anything bad, I figured it's not my problem. But I found out <laughs> it is my problem. If you lay close enough to fleas, you're gonna get some on you. And wound up doing seven years in prison in the state of Florida. And got out after seven years of thinking and wondering what I was gonna do with the rest of my life. Um, and I knew I didn't wanna be doing that anymore. So I had a plan to put together to start a construction company because I couldn't make any money as a medic when I got out of the military. My MOS didn't transfer across to even put a needle in somebody's arm for immunizations to make a decent wage. So construction was the only avenue of approach I took. Um, I luckily ran into an individual who cared about me. Uh, she helped me out getting my business going, a commercial roofing business in Florida after I was project managing with a bigger firm and learned the aspects of that and uh, did a spin-off of a subcontracting company for him and did rather well for a time being until the recession hit and once that happened um, basically I had funds I started school again I was moving in the right directions I was bouncing in and out of the vet centers down there and trying to figure out how I could help out because I knew there was other men like me out there there was other other soldiers and uh, women that get out of the military that have the same problems and the biggest thing I knew that if I didn't give back or I didn't work at that area of my life it was always going to be some dark secret or some dark area that I didn't do anything with it and part of giving back I knew was going to be the salvation part of keeping me from going back to those areas is, is the uh, only thing I could come up with explaining that because in prison watching the recidivism occur over and over again none of these people were giving back to society or doing anything proper to help out that would keep them moving in the right directions and rubbing elbows with the right people so um, when I got out I, I sought out to do that at that point the veteran the VA was actually come had initiated a program for uh, veterans that were being released from prison and I was in and out of uh, Mrs. Savage's office quite a bit trying to help out and still um, I just got married again for my second marriage trying to get my ch other children back into my life from before previously. Um, and it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to do without um, counseling. I know that I wish I had counseling during that process. I probably would have been moving faster in my areas. It also would have helped with that second marriage because I know that there was a lot of garbage I brought into that thing too. And being married right off the bat out of prison just wasn't smart, but I was just so amazed that this person cared about me the way she did. 
and so helpful to help me move forward in life and do great things. And it was a great environment for me, a great family. I learned a lot from them, and they helped me a lot along the way. In return, I took uh, her, her children um, in as my own, basically. And one of her sons, really an intelligent young man, wanted to be an actor. And since the recession had hit, I decided, hey, you know what, give him a shot. I said, I have time right now to do this. I can put my uh, schooling on hold for a little bit and take him to LA and give him a shot and, and hopefully things will work out for him. And it was an incredible ride. I mean, I had three wonderful years watching this kid watching him grow. And his little sister become incredible kids in the process of all this. Um, but once again, the marriage fell apart, my part, I have to own up to her part, her part is uh, what it is. But I can tell you that I believe a lot of this comes from not having, once again, a, people to mentor me and help me across a bridge or a threshold to keep me moving forward in the right directions. And moving into Colorado, um, out of LA, in the acting area for the, for a while, um, I happened to bounce into these uh, mentor groups out here, like um, Team Red, White, and Blue, and Team Rubicon, and the whole camaraderie of being back with my brothers at, bre at a Ranger breakfast that was initiated by uh, Sherry Klein on Facebook kind of brought me home after being lost for so many years. Some of these guys I hadn't talked to in 20, 26 years. <clears throat> and uh, I have to say that uh, the interesting part of once that divorce finished is I was homeless again. I had nowhere to go. I had no place to get started. Uh, I signed into the, the VA homeless program here at Denver a couple times trying to find a place to locate and start over again. I happened to meet a couple friends in the process of it all. They, they gave me a, uh, a job out here because I was really lost for a moment there. I, I didn't know what was going to happen, what I was doing because I poured so much energy into the, my last marriage and I really was so glad I found these guys out here in Colorado. Um, but as I was saying, I still didn't have anywhere to live or anywhere to go back and find uh, a chance to regroup and get a direction. I had to figure this all out on my own, which was very difficult. And I had, I had funding. I had, you know, I had family and friends now that if I called upon them, they could get me a hotel room or they could send me money. Um, I could work. I had a car, and I can understand that. Some of these men out there that have nothing and have to try and come up from that environment to get a foothold and to move forward in life is so hard because I had much more than they had. And let me tell you something, it was tough. It was tough finding work. Um, but as I can say now, um, after a year in Colorado, running around doing everything I could to get my security clearance back, I had my EMT, I went back to EMT school, got my EMT licensing done, got all that going in the right directions. And now, again, since I was in Colorado for a year and moving over, trying to get work overseas right away to get back into what I knew what I, I know what to do, which was soldiering. Um, and it paid lucrative money. And I'm in the process of just now getting my name out there where people are calling me for interviews when uh, I met a, a woman who basically sat me down and said, you know, you've been doing this veterans court thing, which I, I've kind of skipped over that while I was here. First thing I got on the phone was I, I need to get back to giving back to my situation to keep me honest and keep me going in the right directions because I knew it was easy for me to go back into bouncing at nightclubs, doing all that kind of work uh, and it could wind me back up in trouble again. 
So I immediately sought out uh, the veterans court system that they initiated. I heard about it and trying to see how I could help out mentoring or doing anything I can to, to tell you know, men and women out there that your life's not over after a felony. There, there are ways to get back into the system of life and what I call, a lot of people don't like the, the term, but helping people become people again because we forget. We forget how to get into that circle of, of society where, you know, dropping your kids off and picking them up and planning for weekends that you just lose touch of when you get to that point of hopelessness. And I knew that if I got involved with that, that would be you know, my way of keeping me above ground and not going below. And in the process of all, I finally got into a court system. They called me up, uh, I'll never forget Nathan Vitone at the VA. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I got to go in there and sit in a courtroom for the first time and feel like I mattered in the right direction, that I wasn't on the other side of the bench where the judge was focused at me in a negative way. And not that you arrived, but there's a, a big lifting of pressure off your shoulders to be in that courtroom knowing that you're helping. And uh, I have to say that was my turnaround point for Antonio Ruiz because I've been trying to get involved with every location I could closest to me than Boulder, but they don't have a actual uh, veterans court system out there. So what I did was I started this whole event of being there on Fridays or Wednesdays, giving my time to help out. And um, I think that's where the whole idea of regroup started to really focus in and, and become substance with me. Um, I was, every time I, I heard a guy come across and how the judges, every, everybody across the table throwing every great idea they could to help these gentlemen and women out in their uh, turn from hopelessness was the fact that they didn't have a place to regroup. They didn't have a housing environment for them to actually sit down and just worry about getting themselves right because they're so worried about being living on the streets or living out of their cars and not having a viable location to work to work on themselves and um, Stephanie Sultan who I met basically I came home one day and she was like what are you thinking about and I said uh, you know the biggest thing I see in this problem is that we don't have nowhere for these individuals who have a hard time finding rental or uh, leasing problems or they just don't have the funding to do it. They need a place to just regroup for about 18 months. If they had 18 months, I'm, I know it would make a great difference in their uh, transition into the environment where they could just concentrate on themselves and their education portion to move forward and make contacts that would help them where they don't have to make these quick yes and no decisions that we've been taught in, in the military day in and day out for the first eight months that if you don't think quickly, you know, people die. And that kind of decision making out here in the real environment in the civilian populace kills us. It really does. We, we want to answer a question with a yes or no immediately when we should be able to take our time, think out the whole process and make a proper decision for ourselves. And we don't get to do that. So she basically said, well, why don't you, why don't you do that? <laughs> It's the craziest thing because you, when you work in special forces, that's what we do. We go set up environments. We'll drop in a foreign country and, and build a country up from inside out. And that's the mission. And it's so simple out there. It seems so damn hard here. And uh, <laughs> for the first time I've, I was afraid again, I haven't been afraid since jumping in combat in Panama, and that is no lie. When they put shackles on me and shuffled me down those hallways to Florida State Prison System, I fought my way in there every other five or six months when the gangs wanted me in, and I wouldn't abide by it because that's not my thing. 
wasn't afraid, but the whole idea of grasping this uh, idea and trying to push it forward, it, it was pretty scary. Um, but she pushed and she said, you know what? I think your mission is here. Wait a minute. Uh, it's here, it's not, it's not overseas. That this is where you need to make your fight. This is where I'm gonna make my fight. I'm gonna fight to the very end to see that this mission is accomplished. That our men and women have a place to regroup from the moment they get off that plane or that bus, uh, that they're not homeless. They can sit down and find their direction. What makes them tick? Decompress. Get an idea of who they are again, and not just some machine. And uh, I don't want to kill the machine because let me tell you something, it's effective. It keeps you moving. It keeps you in, in places in, where people give up. It keeps you moving forward. Because I know those are some of the skills that why I succeeded and did so well, the things I've been doing. And if you don't think bad people recognize that and want to pull you on their team, keep turning away these veterans and these people that have hopelessness events. They've got nowhere else to go but cling on to those people. So I think <laughs> by giving them a direction and a mission again is very important to our society. Um, being tied to mentors like Team Red, White, and Blue, Team Rubicon, are ex extremely important in our lives to coming back and getting back into the civic and populace again. <clears throat> so, you have a little idea of where I come from, uh, how it, I became so uh, invested into this operation and that it's not easy. I know it's gonna take a lot of moving parts, but I think it can be done um, with the right people on board. And I don't find it to be that expensive. I mean, basically I'm, I'm trying to start a self-sustaining environment with ranching and farming to help subside, be a subsidiary to the operation while there's gonna be a lot of upfront load but once it's moving and making uh, food and cattle, I think it'll take care of itself. And in the process, we've got people to, to come give 18 months there and work on themselves, find direction, mentor them up with the right people and move them out. Um, and get them into their own environments, get them back home, figure out their home. That's what I want for Regroup. That's what I want for our brothers and sisters. And I want you, America, to help me in this operation. Thank you.